We are uh, chatting with Paul Graham. He's a memoirist and a book writer whose recent Memory of Bread was released earlier this year. Um, as a bonus for tuning into the webcast, you'll have the opportunity to win a prize pack, which you'll be able to read about down below. Uh, so please enter. Want to note before we begin that uh, Beyond Celiac receives generous support from sponsors to make programs like this and all our work possible. Today's sponsor is Char. Char uses their expertise and commitment to help those with special nutrition requirements get more out of life. And these cookies, they help me get more out of life. So I want to thank Char for, for being our sponsor today. They've been doing gluten-free foods for more than 30 years and they're a leader in gluten-free products. So, I would love to uh, introduce Paul Graham to you. He is, uh, I uh, recently read his book. It was a delightful read, and I'm so pleased that he's able to join us today. Welcome, Paul. Tell us about you. Well, thanks for having me, Claire. Um, what should you know about me? Uh, just as a quick introduction, I spend most of my time uh, on the campus and in the classrooms of St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, uh, where I'm an English professor and I focus on creative writing, both fiction and creative nonfiction writing, and um, also, also recent American literature. Um, I started out as a fiction writer, and I published quite a bit of short fiction over the last couple of years, first decade of my career, um, and then I began to slowly focus on food, and that dovetailed with my celiac disease diagnosis, and um, all of that came together in this book that I published in June called In Memory of Bread. You mentioned to me when we spoke earlier that you really didn't want your first book to be about your celiac story. Why was that? Well, I just didn't want to write um, a traditional memoir. What I really wanted to be able to do was range through several topics at the same time um, to get a better understanding of celiac disease and to help my readers get a better understanding of celiac disease and what the diagnosis means. So I wanted to cover history and science and immunology and agriculture and gastronomy. And I, I didn't, at least at first, I didn't see a way that I could do that and tell my own story. Um, but beyond that, um, I also knew that writing about um, being diagnosed with celiac disease and making that adjustment to a gluten-free life would call for honesty, um, at times brutal honesty, um, about my own failures, about what it was like, about what I was thinking, what I was feeling, um, about my search for really delicious gluten-free products. And um, I didn't think that... Uh, I wanted to be that honest, but it turns out that I was, so it all worked out okay. One, one uh, bit of honesty that uh, I noted right away was that at, even after you got the, the diagnosis, you, um, I think you went on a little, a little cheating binge. Is that right? Or I, don't know there's a, I don't know there's a cheating binge. I would call it a little bit more of like a kamikaze valediction to my gluten life. Uh, yeah, there's a scene in the book where... Um, and everybody's talking about this scene with me. They want to they talk about it. But it turns out that it's not that irregular for people who have been diagnosed with celiac disease to go and have like one last bite, one last meal. Um, and I write about the time that I went to uh, the local hotel and got a Reuben and downed it without my wife knowing and how I immediately felt really stupid and also really bad. Um, so, yeah, that's part of the honesty. That's part of owning it, I guess. Yeah. And I had to admit that. Well, and I have celiac disease also, and I noted one, one thing that really resonated for me was being able to remember my last gluten-filled meal, and I was, I was right on the verge of diagnosis. I didn't have, have a diagnosis yet, but I, it was coming. You know, it was, the biopsy was done. I was just waiting for the, the results to come in, so I went to a restaurant with friends and had, I'm vegetarian, so I had a, uh, a, a vegetarian Philly cheesesteak, which is just all it's just wheat gluten. It's wheat gluten on wheat gluten. And, and uh, so that was my last one. But um, yeah, and it was, uh, I, I had been eating gluten up to then, so I didn't feel any particularly worse than I had before that. I just didn't know that uh, how much better I was going to feel later. So anyway, that's my, um, that was my little kamikaze um, was the uh, Philly gluten-free uh, or the, the uh, gluten-filled Philly cheesesteak. So we have a debate in the office. Oh, wait, no, uh, before we go there, I want to ask uh, what your path to diagnosis 
uh, was like. It was it was actually fairly alarming. Will you tell us about it? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I I think it was alarming, but you know, now that I've done the research, I don't think it was all that unusual for people with celiac disease. Um, the simple version of the story is that in 2012, when I write about this, right around the holidays, I came down with what I thought was a stomach bug. And, um, you know, the typical GI symptoms associated with celiac disease. But my, my doctor, instead of putting me on an elimination diet, put me on antibiotics. Um, he gave me Cipro. And I took that for a week and felt awful and continued to feel bad. And when that didn't work, he put me on Bactrim. Um, and when that didn't work, he put me on Flagyl which I was finally allergic to. And when I went to the emergency room, they drew some blood and they said, hey, you're really anemic. We wonder why, but they didn't say anything about celiac disease. Um, and they just sent me home with some iron supplements and basically said, uh, good luck, buddy. And um, after that, you know, throughout that time period, I was continuing to eat gluten, uh, you know, toast, uh, pasta, things that I thought would be gentle on my gut and I was actually poisoning myself. So what happened was when I had my, my bad allergic reaction to the flagell, um, I eventually ended up in the hospital to stay. Um, I was in such bad shape that I needed blood transfusions before anybody would do a biopsy, an endoscopy, a colonoscopy, and then any of that. Um, and that was how I came to be diagnosed. Uh, the GI who was on staff at the hospital took one look at me and he said, hey, I think you have celiac disease. Um, I have that or you have Crohn's. Um, but we had to wait a little while. But if I think back through my, my history, um, I actually see signs of celiac disease like all the way back into my 20s. Um, I had skin conditions that were misdiagnosed as eczema. They're actually, they were actually dermatitis herpetiformis, which is you know, one of the early harbingers of celiac disease. Um, I had gut flare-ups. I had, you know, basically 15 years of symptoms that if I had been paying a little bit more attention or if my doctors had been paying a little bit more attention or all of us had been, we probably would have been able to um, uh, figure it out earlier. Um, on the other hand, uh, when you're that sick, you get diagnosed in a hurry and you start to feel better in a pretty, pretty short period of time as well. So it's kind of a mixed blessing there. So oh, as I started to say before, uh, we have a debate in the office about whether or not celiac disease can be a blessing in disguise. Diagnosis, yes, but the disease itself, that's the question. What do you think and, uh, and why? I'm going to say yes, um, because of some of the things that I, I write about in the book. Um, for one thing, switching out gluten when I was diagnosed with celiac disease forced me to become a better cook. Um, I'd always loved cooking. Um, I write about it a lot in the book. I brewed my own beer, I made my own bread, made my own pasta, made my own gnocchi, like those kinds of things. Um, and when I discovered that I couldn't eat those things and I discovered that the substitutions were, you know, okay, but not what I was looking for, um, I, I searched out other food traditions. Um, for instance, Thai food, Indian food, um, Vietnamese food. And these are things that I would have gotten around to eventually but celiac disease really forced me to, um, you know, think about uh, other ways to cook. Um, because my wife went gluten-free with me, um, and I write about that a lot in the book, um, it, it definitely made us closer. Um, and, um, you know, we had some good laughs and some, some really frustrating moments as we went on that journey together. And then I think the final blessing in disguise, if, if that's what you want to call it, is that celiac disease uh, forced me to listen more closely to my body um, than I ever had listened to it before. I was kind of a typical guy um, in the sense that, you know, I just dumped food in and didn't think much about it. You know, I was pretty, I'm pretty athletic, so I liked to go out and, and, and play hard um, and work hard. Um, and, you know, after that, something changed, um, and I just began to uh, think that I never really wanted to be that sick again, which, of course, is something that you don't have any say over, but I didn't want to be surprised that way. So, in a very real way, celiac disease um, turned me into a runner because I figured out that um, I would know that my celiac disease was in remission and that I was getting all the nutrients out of the food that I should be getting if I could go out and do the mileage that I had been doing, you know, pretty much all the time and feel much the same way. So in that sense, um, it, it really did change my life for the better in a lot of ways. 
You, most of our community uh, are, that follow us on Facebook uh, are women. Probably 90% mm -hmm. are women. So yeah. in your experience in talking with people um, since you've written the book, do you, I, I, my guess is you probably hear more from women than men, but what, what kind of reaction have you gotten from, from men, both those with celiac disease and those out in the world who are like, hey, dude, you just talked about all your business in your book. With, you know, what's that about? Well, that, that was part of the honesty that I had to, to get in, you know, in touch with in order to write the book. Um, you're right. I have heard more from women uh, than from men. My hope in, in writing the book is that I will be able to reach more men um, because I think men are in that population of people who have celiac disease who are either undiagnosed or undiagnosed diagnosed or misdiagnosed. Um, you know, I hope that uh, writing about some of the substitutions and lifestyle changes and the way that you ultimately really do feel better um, will perhaps inspire more men to get tested, um, will inspire more men to adhere to the gluten-free diet. Um, and I just, I just had a, a nice letter from somebody um, who has um, type 1 diabetes instead of um, celiac disease. Um, and he said, you know, as, as somebody who um, has an autoimmune disorder and really has to think carefully about his diet, I really appreciated this book because um, it is a little different when you're, when you're a guy, I think, because of that bro code, you know what I mean? You go out and you, 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 you drink your beer and you, you eat your pizza and, you know, that, that old saying, damn the torpedoes and full speed ahead, right? Uh, you can't do that anymore, and it really does force you to to think differently about how you relate to people. Um, but I, I think I think that um, you know there's there's a lot for women in the book too, obviously. Yeah. So by writing this book, you put yourself squarely in the crosshairs of critics uh, who think that people with celiac disease are a bunch of privileged whiners who aren't really that sick. Um, and you know we we see that uh, you know we, we see that all the time. I, I imagine that you're hearing that and wonder how you uh, how the, does it glance off you? How does it make you feel? And how what do you do to, to kind of stay stay in the light? Well, I I got so sick so so fast, and I got so much better um, uh, so fast that a lot of people that are around me never never doubted me. And never said, "Hey, hey, you're a whiner." And because I know um, that gluten is poison for me, um, I always have that to fall back on. But but you're absolutely right. It's frustrating um, when people say, "Oh, you're just you're just doing a trend diet," or um, you know, you are just a whiner, or you're just a hipster, or something like that. And you know, what I tell myself is that um, the science behind um, celiac disease, a lot of it's a mystery. Um, you know, we, we, know the, we know the way that it works on the body, but we don't know what the trigger is, or we don't know what causes the gene to flip on, that kind of thing. Um, and um, the, the way that food reacts to our bodies, or our bodies react to food, all of these things are complex, and a lot of people are not up to speed on the science. Um, they just don't know. And um, if, you're really, if you're really paying attention to things, you can say, okay, well, you know, we can prove that celiac disease is not all in your head and you can, you can prove that it's not a trend because you need to look at the biopsy, right? Um, and I find that if you have a conversation with people about the science behind it, actually, it does change their perspective a little bit. Um, people who have wheat allergy, you know, it's the same thing. There's, there's science on allergies. Uh, you know, non-celiac non gluten sensitivity, as it used to be called, or just gluten intolerance, um, that's a little harder um, because people who, who suffer from that without like the, the genetic markers or without the histamines being present, you know, they have a tougher case to make. Um, but, but look, I think we can all name somebody who has a list of foods that don't agree with them for some reason or another, right? I know, I know people who don't eat nightshades. I know people who, um, you know, don't eat nuts, that sort of thing, because they just claim it makes them feel better. Um, so, so in the end, you know, my thinking on this is uh, live and let live, <laughs> I guess. Um, but also, you know, when you're, when you're confronted with somebody who's really, you know, like doubting you and they're saying, okay, well, isn't that all a trend? Um, you know, stay in the light by falling back on the science and saying, okay, well, there's a, there's a lot of research into this. You know, people are not shooting in the dark here. Um, and I think, I think that helps. 
speaking of, uh, of of managing, you know, a lot of people have a lot of, uh, of food challenges. I want to uh, give a little love to our sponsor, Char. It's a little bit glary in here, but this is, these are the uh, the graham crackers, and I've uh, it's uh, summer during the time of our taping, and I've been uh, I've been doing s'mores, and uh, these are pretty awesome. But Paul, you were telling me you have a you have a different favorite Char product. I'm a big fan of the table water crackers, especially since the recipe has been revamped. Um, they're perfect with just about everything or by themselves. So I just have a bag or two of those in my pantry. Now, do they do they replace something that used to be a staple in your diet, or is it is it a new? Oh yeah, yeah. You remember the you remember the Cars table water crackers? Oh yeah. The little, the little round white ones. You know, you're you're supposed to have them with cheese or fruit or something like that, but they were just all all they were good all by themselves. So this is what I this is what I nosh on instead of them the Char crackers. That's fun. But I like the um, Char recently uh, reformulated their uh, their sandwich bread, which is um, shelf stable, which is great because then I can just I don't I don't have to wait for it to thaw, um, and it's just it tastes really good. So I'm glad they've uh, been working on the working on their formulas and making it better. They've and they probably got more practice than anybody. I think they're they've been uh, they were big in Europe and now they're they're big here and getting bigger, but they've been doing it for 30 years. So um, so. Experience, experience counts, I think. So, well, thanks, Char, for uh, for for sponsoring this program and for your ongoing support of Beyond Celiac. Paul, I wanna um, I wanna see what your advice would be for people who are newly diagnosed with celiac disease. So it's uh, you know it's a it's an adjustment. How would you advise you know somebody? Hey, hey, Paul, I just got the diagnosis. What's the what's your first uh, bits of advice for them. Well, I think my first piece of advice, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a, a metaphor, um, a sports metaphor, since you know we're coming up on pennant races, right? That season in baseball, um, and in the metaphor that I, I think I learned from my mistakes and um, uh, you know would offer people is that you know when you're first starting out after that diagnosis, try to play as many home games as you can, um, and and by that I mean um, you know, eat at home, um, eat in a space that's safe, eat in a space where you have some control over your food, where you don't have to worry about things like cross-contamination or hidden forms of gluten, um, that sort of thing. I, I would say learn to cook. If you, if you don't cook so much, you know, get a good cookbook um, and get the best fresh ingredients that, that you, can, you can afford comfortably. Um, and get into the kitchen and, and get comfortable there and, and learn to love food again because it is a huge shift. Um, and I think, you know, I'm a big proponent of whole food, um, you know, uh, what you might call real food or unprocessed food, especially when your gut is in a state of like nuclear winter, which it probably is after, you know, years sometimes of, of antibodies wrecking havoc on your, on your um, intestines. And um, I think that if, you, if you're eating well, um, you will notice a change um, in, in a short period of time or a shorter period of time. Um, the other thing that I would say is the biggest mistake that I made when I was diagnosed was that I was shy about it. Um, I didn't want to talk about it. Um, maybe that's a guy thing. I don't necessarily think it is. Um, but I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to see my friends. Um, I'd never been different, really in any way for anybody else. And I think that made it difficult for me. So my, my other piece of advice is um, to you know, share what you're going through with your friends and don't be a hero, so to speak. Uh, let them, let them you know, help them learn how to cook for you um, if you want to have dinner at their house or something like that um, and, and cook for them and, you know, try to talk about the experience and what it means and what's safe and what's not safe because people really do want to know, they really do care. Um, but it's kind of baffling for people who don't have to think about cross-contamination or hidden forms of gluten. So I, th I think that's what I would tell people who are just newly diagnosed. And what about the, the veterans? Those, those folks have been diagnosed for 10 or 15 years. What, what would you share with them? Well, I remember reading a while back that the average person um, in the United States eats only about 10 to, different, 10 to 15 different foods in a week, um, which is a curious distinction and, and, and probably a dubious one for a species that's been called omnivorous, right? 
Um, and I know we, we, there's vegetarians and vegans and, you know, people who observe other special dietary restrictions in, in addition to celiac disease. But, you know, my feeling is that the best things happen at the table and that after a while you can be on autopilot and you don't necessarily want to be on autopilot. So, you know, I would say keep exploring, get good cookbooks, learn new culinary traditions and try to figure out ways to um, expand and um, deepen the pleasures of the table and cooking for other people. Um, and do, I, do veterans have the obligation to help people who are, you know, newly diagnosed find their way? I, I, think, they, I think they do. And, um, you know, dropping by a support group and, and, and sharing your story, especially if you've been successful, I think that can be a big gift to people. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I just I feel a need to say that, that people who require um, gluten-free, a lot of them, um, can't afford the products. Uh, on average, the market markup is about 250% compared to um, you know the, the conventional or whatever traditional or wheat-based foods. Um, and food pantries are always low in, in, in GF supplies. So if you're fortunate enough to be able to um, you know donate to um, you know food pantries or even research foundations, that sort of thing. Um, you know, everybody appreciates the donations and that's a great way to help out too. It's a very concrete way to help. And that's, uh, mm -hmm. I, sometimes you, you just gotta have that thing to do, not just to, to yeah. yeah. Great advice, great advice. So here's, this might be a fun question. Um, we'll see, if it's not, you'll pretend to have fun, I guess. Um, if you could, Bring back one gluten-y food to your diet. What would it be? Well, I think the obvious one, the easy one, is bread. Um, and you know, I'm going to hedge a little bit here and say that beer has been called liquid bread because it's the same ingredients, just different proportions minus the salt. So if I can expand it all to say bread in all its forms, liquid and solid, uh, that's what I would definitely want to bring back. Um, but, you know, even more than that, um, and, and I write about this in, in, in the book, what I miss is, uh, what I miss most is, and I think a lot of people with celiac disease who have been, you know, diagnosed years ago will probably agree, um, I miss the experience of being able to walk into a restaurant, look at an item, look at a list of 10, 15 items, and know that I can have any one of them that happens to sound good to me that day, as opposed to just like the one or two down at the bottom, you know, which, you know, are probably safe. Um, that That's something else too that that um, I would I would add back into my diet, but that sounds like it's getting greedy because you only asked me for one food, so. <laughs> No, you know, it's it's an interview, all spare. Um, and I, I want you to, being able to order off the restaurant menu and not just look at the salads, that's, uh, that would be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I have a, I have a book here. Here's your book. It's the lighting here. It's pretty bright. You might not be able to see it. Uh, but tell us, uh, tell us where we can find it. Give us details. Your website, uh, all kinds of stuff. Well, I mean, the details are that it's a, a hybrid memoir. Um, and in it, I use my own story to bookend or frame or contain a lot of things about um, first of all, celiac disease, the history, um, the epidemiology of it, some of the debates and causation, you know, like, is it, is it the wheat? Is it the, the, the so-called hygiene hypothesis? Is it something else? Um, and I also explore the, the culinary tradition that you leave behind when you go gluten-free, but also the one that you join when you go gluten-free. Um, and these are very, very long, deep traditions and, and they're not very well known. So, um, you know, I talk about that. Um, and where, where can you get it? It's basically everywhere. You can find it as an ebook. Um, you can find it as an audio book. And of course it's out in hardback now. Um, there's Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, my website is inmemoryofbread.com. So it's just the title and, um, you can also find it there and you can read a sample of the first chapter too. And if you sign up for our giveaway, you could, you could also perhaps win a copy. Is it true? Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Um, that, that concludes the, the planned questions. Paul, anything uh, to add uh, before we conclude? 
No, thank you very much for listening. Um, stay healthy, stay sane. You do as well. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks for joining us on the Beyond Celiac webcast our, with our special guest, Paul Graham, a memoirist, and uh, whose recent book, In Memory of Bread, is now out there and available and ready for you to read. You'll, you'll enjoy it. Thanks, everybody.